Hi, this is Mike Bloom. Thanks for checking out our sermon today. I pray that this message blesses you and gives you greater victory in your everyday walk in the kingdom of God here and now. God bless you richly. A certain Jew named Apollos was born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus. This man could preach, in other words. <laughs> he was eloquent. You ever hear a preacher that, oh my, can they ever preach? And uh, you hear somebody get up and speak, and they're giving the word of the Lord, but some people just have that anointing on them, that they're just eloquent. Not only that, he was mighty in the scriptures. I'd hate to hear an eloquent man that didn't know the Bible. <laughs> but he had both. Mighty in the scriptures, and he came to Ephesus. And it said, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord. Being fervent in the spirit, he wouldn't have bored you to death when he preached. He was fervent in the spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, but he only knew the baptism of John. So he was instructed in the way of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. See, this shows us that even in the book of Acts, the early church, there were people that had more truth than others. Obviously, the Lord had moved beyond. How many know God used John the Baptist with his baptism of repentance? Obviously, he was a messenger of the Lord. But do you know what ended with the ministry of John and what John wasn't even a part of later on? Something, the Bible says two things ended with John. Anybody know what they were? The law and the prophets were until John. After that, the kingdom of God is preached. And the Bible said that there wasn't a man born of a woman that was greater than John the Baptist. Moses wasn't as great as John. And when you stop and think, well, Moses, my, oh, my. I went into a synagogue once, and the rabbi was talking to us about the Old Testament, of course. It's, a, it's all they know. And uh, Moses, Moses, Moses. I heard more about Moses than I did the Lord. <laughs> they really honor Moses. And then David is the next one they honor. But um, Moses had all these miracles, supernatural signs, deliverance from Egypt and that exodus and, and uh, unbelievable work. I mean, the Bible says Israel saw the works of God, but Moses knew the ways of God. And how many know there's a big difference? Why God does what he does. And Moses went up in the mountain like he passed the veil when he went into the cloud on Mount Sinai and 40 days and 40 nights more than one occasion. Do you know he went up in the mountain for more than one period of 40 days and 40 nights? He went up a couple times. 40 days and 40 nights each time without water. He was supernaturally sustained by God. But John the Baptist was greater than him. Why? Because John was introducing the Messiah. And, uh, but it says, He that is least in the kingdom is greater than John. So John wasn't even in the kingdom. And... Uh, so God did use that, but God had moved on by the time we get to Acts 18. The day of Pentecost had come. Jesus had even died, been buried, and resurrected by this. And evidently, Apollos didn't know that. He only knew John's ministry. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, and they expounded unto him the way of God. Now, he was already instructed in the way of the Lord. But they expounded him the way of God more perfectly. Everybody say more perfectly. More and, uh, and so I always like kicking off a serious study about this type of issue with that scripture and how that God has more for us. Some have more than what others do. Even now it's the same way. How many believe Jesus is a healer? Well, you know as well as I do, there's entire denominations don't believe he heals anymore. That doesn't make them bad. And it's not our place to judge them. But, you know, I like to take it like Priscilla and Aquila handled Apollos. We can lovingly, kindly show unto them the way more perfectly. And so I want to do that with some scriptures here again today. We're going to, how many ever heard of the Romans Road? You ever hear the Romans Road, quote unquote? Um... I'm not going to name denominations. I don't like doing that because I don't want to... It's the message we're trying to get across. And it's not an issue of persons and personalities. Uh, but the Romans wrote certain denominations. This is what they'll teach. I found this on a website. This is what they teach for salvation. It's a pathway you can walk. And the reason they call it the Romans Road is the book of Romans. 
you can just use the Book of Romans and find out how to be saved, they claim. So let's see what they have to say. It's a group of Bible verses from the Book of Romans in the New Testament, and if you walk down this road, you will end up understanding how to be saved. And here's where they begin. First of all, Romans 3 and 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then they explain that, well, we all have sin in our hearts. Not a one of us are exempt from that. Uh, we're born with sin. And so you have to admit you're a sinner. And then they take you to Romans 6 and 23. And then they say the wages of sin is death. So now that you know everyone's born in sin, and then you find out, well, the wages of sin is death. Everyone has to die. So sin has an ending and it results in death. And we all face physical death, which is a result of sin. But a worse death is spiritual death that alienates us from God and will last for all eternity. The Bible teaches us that there's a place called the lake of fire where lost people will be in torment forever. It's this place where people who are spiritually dead will remain. Understand that you deserve death for your sin. And then they take you to the rest of Romans 6 and 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's a free gift. You don't work for it. You don't have to pay the preacher to get saved. <laughs> you can't earn it by all your good works. You've got to reach out and receive it. And so they tell you to ask God to forgive you and save you. And then they go to Romans 5 and 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Wilfred just said that God loves everybody equally. While we were sinners, He loved us. And so it says, He died for us. And so see the picture so far, how they're leading you? Um, we're all born in sin. We've got to pay the penalty for sin called death. And the second death is the lake of fire, hell. But Christ died for us to pay that price. And so when he died on the cross, he paid sin's penalty. He paid the price for all sin. And when he took all the sins of the world on himself on the cross, he bought us out of slavery to sin and death. And he purposely said bought, not brought, because his blood paid for our salvation. You can't pay for it. He did. And uh, the only condition is that we believe in him and what he has done for us. Now, here's where things get interesting. The only condition, all we have to do, is believe in Him and what He has done for us. So let's keep analyzing this. Understanding that we are now joined with Him and that He is our life. He did all this because He loved us and gave Himself for us. And then they tell you to give your life to God. His love poured out in Jesus on the cross is your only hope to have forgiveness and change. His love bought you out of being a slave to sin. His love is what saves you, not religion or church membership. God loves you. And then here's the clincher, they say. Here's what you have to do. Romans 10 and 13. Notice it's all from the book of Romans. Whosoever, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And they say, here's what that means. Just call out to God in the name of Jesus. And then Romans 10 and 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth... He confesses, resulting in salvation. And then this website concluded and said that if you know that God is knocking on your heart's door, ask Him to come into your heart, believe in Him, ask Him to come into your heart by faith, ask Him to reveal Himself to you, open the Bible to the Gospel of John, read what God says about Jesus, about you, and about being born again. And then they mentioned baptism. Water baptism is one of the ways you first show that you've been joined to Jesus. This is an action and actions will not save you. However, it is an act of obedience and a symbol of commitment. Daniel, can you get me Mark 16 and verse 16? Uh, yes. Who else wants to help me with the scripture? Anybody else? He that baptizes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Read it again. He that believeth. He that believeth. Baptized, and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. He that believeth and is baptized shall be what? Saved. saved. Did it say he that believeth and is saved shall be baptized? Nice. Didn't say it, did it? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, this website said that baptism is an action and actions don't save you. 
Meanwhile, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And so I immediately had a question about that statement. Uh, get me 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. 1 Peter chapter 3 and 20. I'm almost getting dry up here. Sometimes we're disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Which what sometimes we're disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was a pre a preparing. While the ark was a preparing. We're in few. We're in few. That is eight souls. That is eight souls water. were saved by water. Keep reading. Um, the like figure where unto even baptism doth also now save us. The like figure unto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not the putting away the filth of the flesh when you're baptized, that is. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. But it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. Baptism, Peter said, was an answer to God that you've got a good conscience. And he said baptism saves us. Now, how many know H2O is water, is water, I've got water in this cup. If I jumped inside that water, the water's not going to save me. But baptism, it said, saves us. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. They put baptism before salvation. And so when this statement said, this is an action and actions don't save you, uh, there's something a bit faulty with that. In one sense, right. Just the act of baptism isn't going to save you. But he that what and is baptized? Believeth and is baptized. You see, if you just get baptized, you're not going to be saved. But if you believe and get baptized, there, Jesus said, you'll be saved. Uh, and then Daniel read 1 Peter 3, 20 to 21. Like water saved Noah... How many know the reason Noah was saved by water is because God told him something, and what did Noah do with what God told him? He obeyed an ark, believed and obeyed and built an ark. So he had to believe. He had to believe what God was going to say. So Noah believed, got inside of that ark, water saved him. The like figure went to baptism saves us. So you can't say flat out it's an action and actions don't save you. Baptism is more than that. It's only an action if you don't believe. That's why uh, I've had people come to me and, you know, you don't speak condemningly and you don't speak cuttingly and, and harshly. But somebody wanted me to baptize their baby once. I said, well, for one thing, baptism is immersion. And I don't want to take your little infant and dunk the whole body underwater. <laughs> I know people that do that. <laughs> I do know them. But uh, how many know what Philip said to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 that disallows a baby from being baptized. Do you remember what he said? Get Acts chapter 8. Anybody know offhand? And somewhere around the last part of the chapter, it's after that, understandest thou what thou readest. Uh, but it's, it's when the Ethiopian eunuch says, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? Verse 36. Verse 36. Read it. And as they went on their way, as they went on their way, unto a certain water, they came to certain water. And the eunuch said, the eunuch said see, here is water. "See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized?" What doth hinder me to be baptized? And listen to what Peter or Philip rather said. And Philip said, "If, Philip thou, said, believest, if thou, thou believest heart, with all thine heart, thou mayest." Thou mayest. And he answered and said, "And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God.' I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. See, he that believeth." and is baptized, shall be saved. And, and then somebody said, well, we don't need to get baptized. There's nobody around to see it. I mean, the Ethiopian eunuch, it's, it's just a public show. Baptism is just, there was nobody around except the preacher and the person. And so it's not a show. That man had to be baptized. Something Philip said cut that man's heart so strongly that as soon as he saw water, there's water, what did it mean to be baptized? Now, in today's modern religion, you don't hear that kind of teaching. Uh, unfortunately, we see statements like this. And again, I'm not, I don't want to be harsh. I'm not judging. If somebody's never been baptized, you know what I say? Let the Lord lead them. Let the Lord do what He wants. But as for me and my house, I believe in baptism is absolutely 
necessary. Absolutely. Um, so let's go to Romans 10. They, they took the Romans road. And does anybody remember who Romans was written to? Uh, can you pass me the Bible there, Iris? Who was Romans written to? Sinners, saved, saints, heathens, pagans. Who was it written to? <laughs> saved people, right? In fact, Romans chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And he goes on and makes this introduction in verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God. Now we know God loves everybody, so that's not really narrowing it down, is it? But then he says, called to be saints. Okay, now he's talking to the church. He's called to be saints. So he's talking to church people, the church at Rome. And so when you're talking to people that are already saved, like the book of Romans does, you're not going to go into the details of how to be saved like you would if you were talking to a sinner, right? So the book of Romans and the Romans Road, yes, they're scriptures, yes, every one of them are true, but they're nowhere near as detailed as the book of Acts when you learn how to be saved. Um, remember we learned that John 3 and 16 said you've got to believe in Jesus and have everlasting life? Paul said in Romans 10, to believe in the heart, confess with the mouth, and you'll be saved. But it's nowhere near the detail. He didn't even mention baptism because Peter said, well, that water saves us. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He didn't even mention baptism in Romans 10. So we're going to analyze Romans 10. Now, what did John 17 and 20 say? Remember Jesus praying to the Father? He says, Father... I not only pray for these disciples of mine. You sent me into the world, and by the same token, I'm sending them. And what does apostle mean in English? Sent one. These were the apostles Jesus was praying for. He says, you sent me, and I'm sending them. And remember how he commented so much that People say, I'd rather listen to Jesus than Peter or John. And I've even heard some preachers don't even want to read Peter and John's writings because they want to listen to Jesus. Well, Jesus sent them. We better listen to them. <laughs> but then he says, I not only pray for these, I'm not only praying for, but I'm praying for everyone that will believe on me through their word. Somebody say, we believe on Jesus through the words of the apostles. And so... Over and over again, the epistles show the apostles telling people they have to obey their words in order to know God. Now let's go to Romans 10. This is where the Romans road led people. And verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which what? Doeth those things shall live by them. The law of the Old Testament was really about doing. Do, do, do. Thou shalt not. So don't do, don't do, don't do. Or do, do, do. It's, it's a law of works and, and doing. So the man which doeth those things shall live by them. What did Martin Luther read one day in the book of Romans that really caught his heart? The just shall live by faith. But here the law said the man which doeth those things shall live by them. So they lived by doing. How do we live? The just shall live by faith. See the difference? And so Moses wrote this in Leviticus 18 and 5. You see, every time the New Testament talks about Moses and, and says it is written or the scripture said, and then it gives the statement that the man which doeth those things, he's quoting from the Old Testament. And this particular line, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them, is in Leviticus 18 and 5. So let's go there, Leviticus 18 and 5. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. See, there's where he's quoting Moses. So let's go back to Romans 10 again. Now verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. See, I, you already answered me earlier. 
The just live by faith, where they live by doing. Now, after it talks about Moses and the law, which says do, there's righteousness, which is of faith. And it speaks on this wise. And he's quoting the Old Testament again. Now, you know what's so interesting? Is the Old Testament was a bunch of do's and don'ts. Now, if your Christianity turns into a bunch of do's and don'ts, you've lost. You've lost it. You missed it. It's faith. And then you might say, well, Mike, you just said we've got to do something. We've got to be baptized. Yes, but only if you believe. I mean, the moment you haven't believed, you're just getting wet. <laughs> I saw people get baptized. They just got wet. I mean, there was no change in their life. There was no... Um, what are we baptized into when we're baptized in Jesus' name? Into his death. You're being baptized into his death. Now, how important is that? But if you just think you're going into water, it doesn't do anything for you. But if you know you're getting into Christ's death, and why do you get into his death? So that like Jesus resurrected, you resurrected into a new life now. You're getting into his death so that you can resurrect with him. And that's what baptism's for. And hardly people know that anymore. But anyway, he's quoting the Old Testament. And he says, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? And then he adds in his interpretation. What that means is, that is to bring Christ down from above. Now, that statement, to bring Christ down from above, that wasn't in the Old Testament. That's Paul's interpretation of this sentence. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? And I'll show you where that statement's written in the Old Testament. Or, now he goes back to the Old Testament, who shall descend into the deep? And then Paul interprets that and says that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. See how Paul saw Jesus everywhere in the Old Testament? I mean, he's reading the Old Testament, and I'll show you in a minute where it is. But he sees Jesus everywhere there. But what does it say? What saith it? And then he quotes it again. The word is nigh thee. Everybody say the word. Even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Now, what did Paul say in Romans 10? You've got to believe with your heart and confess with your mouth, right? Well, he's getting this from the Old Testament. The word is nigh. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. That is, and then Paul's interpreting it. You know what the Old Testament meant when it said the word? Do you know what he meant when he said your word? This word is in your mouth and it's in your heart. He says it's the word of faith that we're preaching right now. And so here you've got an Old Testament that tells you to live by works. And here it had faith right in the middle of it all the time. He said that's the word of faith that we, who is we when Paul wrote the word we, which we preach? Everybody say the apostles. What us apostles are preaching, that word of faith, that's what Moses talked about hundreds of years ago. And it's here now. And so here's where Paul quotes those words in Deuteronomy 30. Now remember what we said about the mouth and the heart. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven. Remember Paul said it's not in heaven. That thou shouldest say, who should go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea, that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word, everybody say the word, is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. He said, you don't have to go far to get the word of God. Oh boy, we better go over to Europe because there's a word over there we need to get. You know, don't fall into that stuff. There's so many Christians going thither and yon to get a word from God. And the Bible distinctly says you don't have to do that. <laughs> Who shall go over the sea for us? Let's go to South Africa. Let's go to Australia. Get a word from God. No, it's so close to you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. Well, what word is that? Paul told us the word of faith that we preach. That's it. So that, everybody say this commandment. He calls it this commandment here in verse 11. And then he calls it the word down here in verse 14. Now Romans 10 is quoting this chapter. How many can see that? Right? So actually if you read Deuteronomy 30 and go to the first verse, he's saying, Israel, if you ever get scattered, if you ever get dispersed because you've sinned against me, he said, if you'll believe this commandment, you'll come back to me. 
And he says, I don't care where you are, I'll bring you back if you obey this commandment. And he said, this commandment isn't far. It's not way up in heaven. It's not way down there. It's not across the sea. It's very close to you. It's in your mouth and it's your heart so close. You couldn't get any closer. And he said, Paul said, that's the word of faith we're preaching. Praise God. So back to Romans 10 and 8. But what saith it? In other words, what is the Old Testament saying? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. And he's quoting Deuteronomy 30, verse 14. He's giving the interpretation of that. And by the way, let me pause for a second. When the apostles give an interpretation of the Old Testament, they're right. <laughs> if you get an opinion about a verse that they don't agree with, guess who's wrong? You. <laughs> they're right, not us. And so... The word of faith that Paul was preaching, that's the word that Moses was talking about. So Deuteronomy 40 and 14, or rather that should be 30, I got a typo there, is dealing with, everybody say, the word of faith. I know one man, he, he themes his whole ministry, the word of faith. And uh, that Paul was preaching, and he referred to it as this commandment in verse 11. So that commandment, isn't it, now listen, isn't this interesting, the commandment that would restore Israel to their land was believing the gospel that Paul was preaching. You may say, how is that going to get Israel to their land? And by the way, Israel became a nation in 1948. Did they believe that word, the faith that Paul preached? No. In fact, most Israelites are any, are, don't even believe in God over in Israel. But how many know God loves them? And that was his people in the Old Testament. And we need to reach out. They need to come back to the family. Amen? How many want to see Israel saved? Wouldn't that be awesome? And so anyhow, that's the commandment that Paul said would restore Israel. You know what? The Bible's promised that God is going to give this word of faith to Israel and they're going to be saved. That's going to happen. You watch. It's the gospel restoring them back to God by a new covenant. You see, it's not so much a land that God's concerned with now. How many know God gave them that land? But that, that's not God's real concern. He's concerned about them getting in the kingdom. I mean, the piece of land can be a natural kingdom, but how many want them to be born into the real kingdom? Praise God. So verse 9 of Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth. Now the reason he said, if you confess with your mouth and then believe in your heart is because when he was quoting Deuteronomy 30, he said the word is in your mouth and it's in your heart. So Paul said, okay, I'm applying that to the gospel. And by the way, this is Romans 10. If you read Romans 9, he's talking about Israel getting saved. If you read Romans 11, he's talking about Israel getting saved. So what's he going to do to appeal to Israel? He's going to use scriptures that Israel believes in. I mean, if somebody came up to you and you were a Jew and you didn't believe in Jesus, what good is it going to do to you if they quote the New Testament? It's going to do nothing for you, is it? Well, I don't even believe in that. But if somebody quotes Moses, remember what I told you about what the rabbi said? Man, they honor Moses. That's why even Jesus said, Moses wrote about me. And that's why he said, David wrote about me. He, he quoted these guys that the Jews really honor because that's going to appeal to them. And, and so the reason he mentioned the mouth and the heart was only because Moses used those terms. And he said, you will be saved if you do that. So... Does that mean I just got to believe he existed? I just got to confess Jesus and, and call on the name of Jesus? Okay, I'm calling on your name, Jesus! I'm saved. Am I saved? Well, no. Or uh, you hear people say, accept Jesus as your personal Savior. You hear people say, accept Jesus, uh, uh, accept him into your heart. Raise your hand if you, you believe in the Lord. And all these statements, but let's, let's find out what the Bible says. Paul, if you, everybody say, keep reading. If you keep reading, and this website quoted Romans, called it the Romans Road with all these sequence of Romans verses. So let's really look at what Paul was saying in Romans. Verse 10, for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. That's why Moses said it's in your heart. And with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. And that's why Moses said it's in your mouth. It's so close. Made unto salvation, the word unto how many of you ever heard of the King James Version? Unto. Unto. It means towards. Towards. It's towards salvation. You're on the track. You're on the road. 
I don't know if I'd call it the Romans road, but you're on the road. Unto, so let's keep reading. Verse 11, for the scripture says, everybody say the Old Testament again. Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference. Now he's not quoting the Old Testament in verse 12. He's commenting on that. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever, Jew or Gentile, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now notice this first sentence. Whosoever believe on him shall not be ashamed. That's from Isaiah 28 and 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious stone, and sure from it. He that believeth on him shall not make haste. That's translated by Paul as Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And then he quotes Joel 2. Notice he said here, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here is he quoted Joel 2 and 32. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Same word, delivered, saved. For in Mount Zion, Jerusalem shall be deliverance, etc., etc. So somebody say, keep reading. So here's we, fi we find out that more than confession and belief actually saves us. Because people stop reading there at Romans. Oh, just believe in your mouth. Or, <laughs> believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. And you're saved. And they say, okay, let's... No, no, keep reading here. Look, don't stop yet. Keep in mind, Jesus said, you've got to believe on me through the apostles' words. Back in John 17 and 20. So Romans 10 and 14. How shall they call on him? Now we're getting into some meat here. How? See, everybody says, well, I'll call on the name of Jesus. Am I saved, Pastor? No, it's how you call on him. Let's find out what that means. If you haven't believed, how are you going to call on him? You wouldn't call on somebody you don't believe in. So number one, you've got to believe. And how shall they believe in him who they have, not, they have not heard? Well, how can you believe? Nobody told me what to believe in. Please tell me. I need to hear. Okay, here's what you need to hear. Now you believe it? Yeah. Okay, now, now you know how to call. Everybody say, how to call is the all-important issue here. And how shall they hear without a preacher? You need a preacher. You need a man of God. And by the way, if you're sitting here and you'd like to be a preacher one day, don't do it unless you're called. Well, I'd like to be a doctor. This one says, I'd like to be a dentist. I'd like to be a preacher. No. <laughs> Preaching is a calling. You have to have an actual experience with God where you are called to preach. That happened to me. We were singing that song from Isaiah 6, I Saw the Lord. Glenn was singing it. The angels cried, holy, holy, holy. You keep on reading down there, whom shall I send? And then Isaiah said, send me. I was reading that one Bible study, and I got knocked over by the power of God. God says, I'm sending you to preach. Yeah. I was 16 years old at the time. And here I am, 51 now. I've been preaching for all these years. I had a calling. And so, notice, you have to have a preacher. And by the way, not just any preacher. Well, I want that preacher down there. Well, what's he preaching? Is he preaching what the apostles preach? Or he doesn't even want to listen to the apostles. So he talked about Isaiah believing. You won't be ashamed. He explains you can't call on the Lord if you haven't believed. And it's like uh, Nicodemus hearing Jesus say, you hear me talk about being born of the water and spirit and you don't receive our report? Remember we preached on that? Romans 10 and 15, and how shall they preach? Now we're going to the preachers. How shall they preach except they be sent? sent. What's apostle mean? Sent. See, somebody say we must learn what the apostles taught. We must learn. That is the message that will show you how to call in the name of the Lord. What does apostle mean? As it is written, you know why this scripture says how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace? I've never seen beautiful feet in my life. You ever seen beautiful feet? Some feet I don't want to see. <laughs> but what's that mean? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel and bring glad tidings? You see, those feet brought those preachers to you. That's why they're beautiful. That's what it means. If I hadn't, those people hadn't had feet, I'd never heard their gospel they had to preach. So thank God they're beautiful feet. <laughs> That's what he's saying. So somebody sent of God, just like Jesus sent 
the apostles, they're the ones you need to listen to. But they have not all obeyed what? Romans 10, 16, they have not all obeyed what? The gospel. You see, there's a lot of preachers, a lot of messengers have gone out. And a lot of them have preached the gospel. Some aren't. So you need to know what the apostles preached and find out if that preacher preaching to you is preaching what the apostles preached. How many times did I say preach right there? <laughs> For Isaiah said, Lord, who's believed our report? You see Paul quoting from the Old Testament everywhere here. And I'm bringing this to a close now. Paul added a whole lot more to just believing. He said you need to know how to call on the name of the Lord. And you can't do that unless you believe. And you can't believe unless you've heard something. And you can't hear unless a preacher's preached to you. And, and you can't preach unless you've got the word from God and God has sent you. You have to be preaching the apostles' doctrine. And I'm going to show you word for word what they preached. In fact, you know what I'm going to do as we close this afternoon? I'm going to skip way ahead. And then we're going to go back to all these pages and I'm missing next time or whenever the Lord leads. We're going to do this last week, but the Lord led somewhere else. And I'm going to bring you right down to what the apostles actually told people when they asked how to be saved. Acts chapter 2. And way down here. Verse 36 of Acts 2. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified. Now this is the man that lied and cursed when a little girl challenged him. And now he's staring in the faces of men, just been filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, and he said, you crucified him. Somebody said Peter was changed. You crucified him, both Lord and Christ. And then in verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren... Everybody read it with me. What shall we do? How many know people are still asking that question today? What do I do? What do I do? And every time I read these words, I think of this question I heard a preacher make years ago. If this question hasn't changed, then why, oh why, oh why, have people changed the answer? Folks, if somebody ever asks you what should they do, you give them this answer that Peter gave them. My God, give them this answer. Don't ever depart from what those apostles preached. This is the apostles we're talking about. These are the ones Jesus said, as you sent me, Father, I'm sending them. These are the ones who said, here's how you know the spirit of truth and error. 1 John 2 and 4. He that heareth us knows God. He that doesn't hear us knows not God. And so when anybody ever asks you what to do, you tell them these words. Angels will be leaning over the guardrails of heaven watching to see what you're going to say. God's going to be standing there and wondering if you're going to obey His word or not. And I don't know if the apostles and the prophets and all those guys up in glory look down every now and then. I don't know. But if they did, they'd be watching. Peter, they're going to say what you told them to do? Let's see. Then Peter said unto them. Everybody say then. How many know then is talking about when? When did Peter say that? When they were pricked in their hearts. Don't, you're wasting your time if somebody's not been pricked in their heart. If you tell them about Jesus dying on the cross and they need to be saved, oh yeah, tell me another myth. Don't, don't talk anymore. But if they get pricked in their heart, then do what Peter did. Then Peter said to them, everybody say repent. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And three, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. How many feel God's calling you? Well, that promise is for you. Praise God. If God called you, this is for you. Some people say Peter was only talking to the Jews, Mike. He didn't say just the Jews. He said to you, your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord shall call. This is their promise. Kind of makes it more from just the Jews, doesn't it? This is for you. Somebody say, this is for me. And when you keep on reading in Acts, it says, verse 40, and with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. 
then they, how many know, some people don't gladly receive the word. It goes in one ear and out the other. It's gone. The devil steals it out of their hearts, lest they believe. Remember the parable? But they that gladly receive it were baptized. Look at how much they talked about baptism. Now you don't hear that, unfortunately, today. And the same day, look how many people were baptized. 3,000 people! <laughs> Well, that's a little inconvenient, Peter. Maybe we can put off that baptism. Shut your mouth. We're getting them baptized. <laughs> 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly. Oh, I love those words. In the apostles' doctrine. Fellowship. Breaking bread and in prayers. And Acts 2.38 and the rest of their teaching, that's all a part of the apostles' doctrine. Now you can take Acts 2.38 like it's an Acts and 2.38s <laughs> and kill people with it. You don't know what we know. Your church doesn't preach what we preach. Don't ever get that attitude. Don't ever get that attitude. Say this with me. God's their judge. God's. You might say, well, what happens to people? They love God. They never obeyed Acts 2.38. God's their judge, not me. But if you want to know the way more perfectly, Apollos, Acts 2.38 is what the apostles told people to do. Amen. How many believe the promises for you and your children? And to all that are far off. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Baptism isn't just to show. Peter actually said, you get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Woo! You may not have been told that before, but there it is.